All right. We're back, baby. I'm Querigo con Kiko, and I'm back here with my boys at a day in Miami's podcast, Eddie Moya and Georgie Ramos, one of the best chefs and friends that I have in my life. What's up, Georgie? What's up, buddy? How are you? Pleasure What's to have you man? here. I hear a lot about you. Uh, he does, and he doesn't do interviews a lot. He doesn't do interviews. And so I have to nice. beg him. What do we give you? Give you this is my first uh, podcast, exclusive. so there's going to be a lot of people upset. But Is, is that is that true? It's true, yeah. How, many, how often do you get invited, more or less? You'd be surprised, yeah. to be honest with you. Yeah, Maybe man. like once a month. Wow, I think that's good. Lot. Yeah, it's good. I mean, that's a lot. He, uh, me and him have a lot of history. Uh, when I started my my segment on TV and stuff, he was my first guest. And I think I've covered like six of his concepts now. Yeah. So uh, within that time, we became friends. And, and obviously, he's a great chef. And uh, But he doesn't like to talk too much he about feels himself very, or anything. He feels very low-key, you know, and- yeah, yeah, I'm not. I'm not a big uh, limelight kind of person. Like, I guess, like, yeah, no, he takes it all. So I mean, <laughs> sure I let him have it. Let him <laughs> he have does it. a good job with it. He's yeah, responsible he with it. it. You know, he loves it. Georgie, talk to us, man. What? what uh, obviously, I know what, what restaurants you are, but tell these people a little bit about yourself and what uh, what you got going on restaurant. Wise. Yeah, so I mean, I I started in the restaurant business, just crazy. I just yesterday I realized the dates. Fourteen years ago, fifteen years ago, I opened 14. up the Joint Bar and Grill. Um, and here we are now, 15 years later, I have Savada Rooftop in Coral Gables. We have Vice City Pizza. Um, we just signed a lease in South Miami. So hopefully that's going to be the next. Uh, oh, really? South thing. Miami. Talk to me more about that. What's it going to be called? Wait, 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 wait. Um, Vice City Pizza is phenomenal. It's amazing. It's amazing. I have a great pizza boy. Yeah, that he loves it when I call him that, Carlos. Yeah. Carlos is a good oh, friend oh. of mine. Well, um, yeah, and know. he's doing it all. So I guess I guess look at Instagram, and so he's doing he's doing the work. Well, no, you know what's funny? I know Carlos yeah. very well. I played yeah. basketball with him. That's I know not, I know now he doesn't show up at the courts anymore. We've no, no, there's no, for there's years. no way that guy's playing basketball. He doesn't show up at the courts anymore. And yeah. he's not lifting. Isn't that lifting anymore? No, he had a he, he had broke a baby his arm and or something like that, or no, he did he get injured? He had a baby. Oh. But the reason why I'm asking you, and I'm telling you this, is because I, I think I ate one of the first uh, Detroit-style pizzas when he was cooking it out of his house, his house. Right there on 162. Yeah. And I'm West Kendo, and he called me over. He goes, hey, I want you to try something, and it was to put it on the page. Yeah. I think the IG already started, mm-hmm. and you guys were working out of Ave Maria, Maria. Yeah. you know? Um, and I was like, damn, this is pretty good. And, you know, he, and I know a little bit about Carlos's history, et cetera, yeah. from, you know, being yeah, a chef. Yeah, yeah, And then fast forward... And out of nowhere, one day, I get tagged in a Dave Portney. Mm-hmm. He went to buy City Pizza. And we put that up on the DMI page, and it just went completely it's bonkers. Go. Yeah. You know, so I wanted to ask you, I, I haven't talked to Carlos about this. Mm-hmm. What was, like, the difference between the day before he went and the day after he went? Of, um, of, go, of being on one bite, you know? So if I'm, if I'm going to be honest with you... Um, The concept was always doing well, and Abby was always doing well, so we were always busy, and we were always very limited out of that location because there wasn't a, we didn't have a real kitchen back yeah. there. So if you ever went to Abby, it was always meant to be just like a cocktail bar, because we had Barty next door, so it was like, go eat food at Barty, come to Abby, and then with right. COVID, um, our lease ended at Barty, we didn't renew it, so we were kind of like forced to, like, let's figure life out. So it was always one of those things that I, it, it's hard to judge because we're already at our, our max output. Um, ah, because right, he did go to that location. Yeah, you know, the Abby. time that you guys had both open at the same time, though, no? It was, it was, it was. I think it was happening as we we're getting ready to open out west. It might have been like right before, yeah. like a few weeks before, or maybe a week or two into it. But I'm pretty sure it was a few weeks before. Um, and obviously, what, what we did get was an influx of new customers from COVID, um, bro. He was cruising through COVID with takeout. He was yeah. one of the first yeah. to start the takeout process, even with the craft cocktails to the house. So he literally like felt nothing. I mean, obviously everybody took a hit, but he yeah. like reacted, and then that's where that, where that change came, and then the separation. Yeah, and that, and that, and then yeah. So like Carlos' story was Carlos is obviously young, extremely talented, Phenomenal worked at his restaurants. Yeah. Um, and from my first like kind of real restaurant, uh, Barty and Swine, he's always come in and it was friendly. And she, Carlos was probably like 25 back then. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he was going through the, he was going through the, like the, the shit, like being a chef and yeah, yeah. life kind of sucks. And he went to Washington DC. Before he went to Washington DC, he was working with me at Barty for a little bit. Went to DC. I interviewed um, him before that when he was at that Peruvian spot. Yeah, he did. He did the Peruvian spot too. Where Salt Bay is now. Yeah, I forgot the name of the spot, but he knows what I'm talking about. 
and he kind of he was kind of down and out of the cooking. He was getting back, getting into real estate. He wanted to quit. COVID came. Didn't go well with him in Washington with the company he was with. Um, he worked at Zuma, no, for a while. He worked at Zuma for. Oh, he worked yeah. for that group in London, Peru. Oh. He did a bunch of good stuff. But he's a, he's an extremely talented chef, good kid. Um, and one of the best choices was like one day I was like let's make pizza out of Abby and let's have fun with it. That's the best way to do it, man. Yeah. When you have fun with something, it just kind of happens naturally and it doesn't feel like work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I remember the first time we did the pop up, we had this <laughs> the small pizza oven, and I, I blamed myself. I was kind of like, "Do you do you?" And I took off to my house and the keys and kind of left them stranded left them there. Out, yeah. But it might have been a good learning experience of for him. Of course, you need that. Because he got his ass kicked. I remember his And that first, whole staff got his ass his kicked. It was, a, it was a one Sunday we did. I'm like, oh, we're not really open on Sundays, but let's do it. And I just remember the calls. Yeah, and I'm the like, first trial at Abby. He was, was like, oh. he, was, he, was, he was nervous. I, remember, was, I walked into Abby's kitchen and yeah. it had like just one, it was just like one oven. One big oven, yeah. Three, three, so three, that, three spaces. He was, he was with me at the rooftop. Um, and I'm, a, I'm an extremely cheap person, except when it comes to buying stupid shit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sounds like someone I yeah. know. It's a good. So like I'm very, yeah, I'm very, I'm very, I'm very like on you. But when it comes to buying stupid shits, I'm always on like the the websites for like the restaurant auctions. Yeah. And he was he was doing my raw bar at the rooftop, and then that pizza oven came up, and I'm like, Abi Maria. These days was just I was just mentally and like exhausted, physically yeah, mentally exhausted with the the whole COVID thing, and opening up the sure, rooftop bro. was super fun. And I was looking for an escape from Abi. As far as people think smaller is usually easier, but if you have multiple restaurants, smaller is worse because it takes more effort because you can't hire as well. I'm like, how do I get this headache? And then that oven came up. I'm like, Carlos, let's do uh, Vice City with this oven. And he was like, you sure? I was like, yeah, I'm buying an oven right now. So we bought the oven two weeks later, we opened by Vice, and, and it's gone great. That's incredible. Yeah. I was going to ask you something. I, know. I got a fun question. No, no. I got something that like this is, I mean, listen, I can talk to chefs. I can mm-hmm. talk to Kiko all day long, every day. Oh, I'm sorry. It's gonna we be... have a lot, you know, we naturally are involved in a lot of marketing campaigns for restaurants, which is great. You know, I yeah. have a lot of friends that are chefs. Brother, what does it take to be a chef? Because I see the struggle you guys go through and mm-hmm. never in a million years will I ever open a restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's funny. Um it's, I've had two people close to me in the last few months to a year, like, come to me like, yeah, I want to open a restaurant. And my answer to them right away is always, don't ruin your life. Yeah. Don't do it. It seems fun. It seems sexy. But you have no idea how hard it is. Um, one, neither one of them listened to me, by the way. Yeah, it's probably your passion. Because they, and I'm, and I, like, I was actually with one of them this weekend, and hopefully they don't get mad at me. And we were talking about it. And I was like, you have no idea. Oh, but I'm doing great in this business. I'm like, you have no idea. Yeah. You really have no life. idea. You give up your life. Look, my life now after 15 years yeah, is semi, it's semi-normal. It's probably amazing for most people to do what I do. I, I'm getting ready to ruin it again by a new restaurant in South Miami. But, I mean, I spent 14 years, 13 years doing 100 so hours a week. Yeah. Well, that's what I was going to say. It's one, of those, it's one of those things where... Si pega, pega. Yeah. And the the, yeah. the the work isn't the hard part. Like getting up and going to work from nine a.m. to midnight isn't the hard part. The hard part is the stress. The like, yeah. like what are my numbers today? Like, I, like my Dealing wife would people, tell you, your employees. Yeah, up they, and down. Th- listen, the employees and the people. It's 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 not the hard part. It sucks at times, but it's not the hard part. The hard part is. Yesterday I did, and let's just do round numbers, 5,000. But last week on this day, I did 8,000. What happened? And now you're sleep at You don't sleep at night. Like, let me work on your menu. What's going on? Yes. What's this guy doing that's better than me? So, like, it's not so you got to get back to that eight or beat that eight. So, every day is a competition from last week. To, and that's the hard part, and that's the mental strain yeah. that most people don't get. My wife would tell you I'd get home at 1 o'clock in the morning, take a shower, then lay in bed for 10 minutes and be like, fuck this let me get up start studying start working on menus until four in the morning so she knows how i was yeah um luckily now like i said it's 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 I'm, i've gone past that and maybe those are steps you have to take in life but i definitely um would tell most people if you have two or three hundred thousand dollars open up a restaurant spend ten dollars on lottery every week instead <laughs> yeah i chance. I was going to say this no? I think the, the situation yeah, yeah. with a restaurant is that there is so many variables uh, for so you to have to the, have the, something the reality good. Is, and about weekends. The reality no, is that there's it's just people. like the person needs to go in, 
They need to like the menu. They need to want to come back. They need to see your place. They need to want to revisit yeah. you. There's so many and, and so you can't you can't have one off minute. You know, you if for, if you if you do a great example at the rooftop, we probably do on a Friday six seven hundred people on it from between five to midnight. If just one play comes out wrong. It's the only industry where that person was like, oh, well, you that know, was there, there wasn't enough salt on this. Correct. So let me go ahead and tell everybody how horrible <laughs> yeah. you are at your life yeah. and at your job because that one person out of 700 people. So you have to be perfect every, every time. time. Yeah. You have to swaddle, like, the insults. You have to swaddle. And I remember there was a time where I was, I, I wanted to be that guy, like, looking up and, like, post something. There was a time there were chefs doing that, and I was like, it was no, crazy. I'd tell him, like, yo, You've what are these guys around. doing? Now I learned, like, now I, I'm like Tua. I don't look at reviews. I'm just like, if somebody needs something, like, I, you look at the reviews tour, and... Just grind, baby. And just, and grind. just grind. But, like, what I tell people, there's people who are a million times better at this than I am, and they fail. Yeah. So people's mentality of, oh, you know, I could do a restaurant. I saw a yeah. Food Network. Let me go ahead and open up a restaurant <laughs> next a week. i parties at the house. And listen, there's a lot of times it works out, but 99% of the times... You just ruined your life. Well, and the first four years of my no, life, my no. first career was at, <laughs> maybe you guys don't know this, is Dandy Bear. Oh, my God. So we I was a talk, chef. We have to talk about Dandy Bear again, I was a ben? chef for four years. I would cook pizzas. You know I would you know do the funny? dough, you know all what's, that stuff. You, and I hated it. I would get home smelling like grease. You know, you know what's funny? Dandy Bear. Did you hear what he I said? I, I get upset when people call me chef, and he worked at Dandy Bear, and he's calling himself yeah, a chef. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know what? <laughs> Hey, he, that's not the first time he's mentioned Danny Bear. Listen, but it's a whole tema. What is the I difference he between a that. chef and a cook? Like, Ooh, I think it's all ridiculous. I think he's like, I don't, I'm not a titles person. Um, I say I'm a hustler and I do what I do to survive and take care of my family. He became, I think he started as a cook and now he's a full blown chef. He doesn't you, like to be called chef, but I don't give a fuck. But what gives you the actual chef title is what you study. So I think the so chef study is it's, it's if, you, if you lead a kitchen, you run a kitchen. I think leading a kitchen, not just being a cook, lead a yeah. kitchen. Because a lot of people can cook, but the lead a kitchen. I mean, he's calmed down a lot through the years. Before, he wasn't so nice. I can obviously say when he was in the grind in the beginning. Now he's more established. His personality has calmed down a little bit more. From my experience with him. Well, stress gives a lot. So, you know, yeah. so he's Anxiety in a nice stress. spot now. But like he says, I mean, the beginning is just murderous, bro, you know? It's murderous. But one of the things I wanted to do because I used to a- fuck people up in the kitchen. Like, like Gordon Ramsay's bro, done. like Gordon yeah, Ramsay had nothing on yeah, me. Yeah, don't, don't worry, and, we'll and, edit that part out. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's part of life and growing up. You just don't know better, yeah, you know. Yeah. You have all this stress on you. Where let, well, let's let's go back if you want, and because not many people really know my story and how I got into the the restaurant business. I never worked at a restaurant in my life. I was never a food runner. I was never a yeah. busser, dishwasher, cook, server. I guess ate and drank a lot. Um, and I was in the real estate business, and I was extremely successful at a young age. Um, and to kind of like narrow it down, I tell people at 24, 25, I probably had a net worth of like five or six million dollars. Wow. Um, got ahead of myself because you know, like my biggest thing now is controlling your ego. That's not open up eight hundred restaurants because you think you could do it. Yeah, be yeah. cool, but control your ego. And I guess at that time I wasn't smart enough to control my ego and like resist kind of temptation of what could be. Um, and we bought a bunch of property. Um, I'm familiar with Cutler Rigs or Home Depot um, down by Eureka and like yeah. 7th. We bought about f- seven acres there of commercial land and we built out, I want to say like 400,000 square foot of commercial mixed use space. Um, thinking, you know, I'm going to turn this 4 mil into fucking 10 mil and that 10 mil into 20 mil. And you know what? By the time I'm 30, I'm going to be hanging out with the Redata group on the beach <laughs> somewhere chilling, you know? Not, not, about, not about that. Like, George Garcia is going to call me. Like, hey, what are you doing today? And I'm be like, listen, don't worry about what it's I'm doing. Me, worry about you. Yeah. So that's where I thought my life path was going. Um, unfortunately, it was in 2008, 2009, the banks collapsed. I got my CEO a month after the banks collapsed. And I went from having 80% of the project sold to now nobody wants to finance anything. And I had all my properties and lines of credit on that project. And seven months later, I was homeless. Wow. So not just that I used everything. My family lost everything. My parents, myself, my grandparents. So that was wow, a struggle to go ahead and figure out what are we going to do with life now. That is um, rowdy. So the story went like this. Um, my father is the one who was the cook. He was like the family cook, the neighborhood cook, the friends cook. Hey, come to my house and cook for us. Let's hang out. So I always had that like in my background. And then I always had the idea of, of cooking for, not for you and Kiko, but I'm going to cook for some girl because I know if I cook for her, we're going to yeah. have, you know. Yes, sir. We're going to have a good time. Close the deal. So I was always cooking and like I was away at school and I would cook for my teammates and I'd have fun. So it was, it was always enjoyable for me. But everybody knew my father was 
that cooking always had aspirations of being in a restaurant maybe one day in the future. And then we were looking to have an old partner of ours had a project in Miramar. And he was like, listen, I know you guys are in a bad place right now. I have this corner that I've never rented out. You want to do a restaurant there? Now, none of us had any idea what it cost to build a restaurant. That's day like, one barley, bro. Huh? No, it wasn't. This, uh-huh. was before, this, was, this goes before that. The little, the little spot in that? In that no, this was in Miramar, um, not in the greatest yeah. neighborhood. And back then, what was popular were CeCe's Pizzas. Yes. Oh. So I'm like, we're going to do something similar to CeCe's Pizza. So me being a hustler, I'm like, call CeCe's Pizza. I met with them every week. Just try to get as much. If, don't, like, I never opened one up, so you can't sue me. Get as much information and learn as much as I can and try to put together so we could do something to replicate it without paying those those crazy the fees. Pieces. So we got all the information. We start day one of the process. We go to the city and they're like, yeah, impact fees for a thousand square foot spot in Miramar was like 120000 back then. And my guy was like, yo, this, I'm not giving you half a million dollars to open up a yeah. CC's pizza. Yeah. So we were like, fuck, what do we do now? But we always had the itch. And then I was like trying different hustles. Um, and every day I look at Craigslist and one day in Port St. Lucie, I see CeCe's Pizza open for sale. So I go to my own man. I'm like, listen, why don't we go up there, take a look at it. Maybe if we buy it, we'll go back to this guy and be like, yo, listen, I got the CeCe's Pizza oven already. It's brand new. And he'll be like, gamble you and let's, let's go ahead and do it. So we drive up to Port St. Lucie, show up to this guy's house, huge mansion, like four car, gar- like four door, gar- like huge garage, like four doors. He opens the door. He's like, listen, man, I need you to do me a favor. And I'm like, Okay, guy, whatever. He's like, I have four, I think it was like four or five CC's pizzas. I'm getting rid of number six, and they pissed me off, so I told them to go fuck themselves. I have the entire restaurant in my garage, and my wife's about to leave me because of it. It's like, how much would you pay for everything? And now remember, I'm homeless, saving in my grandparents' house. Mm. I had like $2,000, like, look what I saved up. I'm like, I don't know, but like 10 G's because it's yours. He's like, can you come pick it up in two days? And I'm like, bro, here's two G's. I'll figure it the fuck out. Yeah, yeah. Get back in my car. The whole ride home from Port St. Lucie to Miami, I called everybody I knew. I'm like, listen, bro, when I had, like, I didn't have to say it, but when I had money, I like, it. you wouldn't pay. Like, we'll go to dinner. I'm paying, you know? Yeah, because of luckily I was, I'm like, anything you could give me, I'll pay you back. And there was like, I was looking at people like, yo, here's a couple hundred bucks. Here's 500 bucks. One of my best friends, Chicho, was like, bro, whatever you need. I forgot how much money he gave me. He was the first one, gave me a bunch of money. Um, helped me out. By the time I got home, my mom had some jewelry. We had some jewelry, sold it, came up with the 10 Gs, got a U-Haul truck. Drove up, filled it up, the car, the two U-Hauls by ourselves. Second I pulled out that guy's driveway, I called CeCe's Pizza. And I'm like, I have an entire CeCe's Pizza. Tables, chairs, everything, wrapped up brand new. Between Port St. Lucie and Key Largo, who's opening one up who wants everything at half price? The guy called me 30 minutes ago on, on, on Flagler 87th. He'll take it right now. So I even went home. I dropped it off on Flagler 87th. I left the car there. Guy gave me a check for 80 Gs. Um, next week, fucking did the stupidest one. Well, not the stupid one. The greatest, but one of the dumbest <laughs> things in my life. Double was, down. Double down. And I'm like, uh, now I have 80,000. I said, let's, let's see what we could do that's smart. Yeah. Let's go ahead and scratch that restaurant itch. Again, never worked in a restaurant in my life. Never done anything. Oh, jump, huh? And great location, stupid location, great reputation, horrible rotation. I took the old, um, oh my God, my mind's went blank. Not in there, no, no, in, in Miami where Rosas and Toaster's at, the big sports bar um, that was Hooligans. Hooligans. We took the old big Hooligan spot. Now, granted, like I never really went to Hooligans; just always heard about it. I went to Hooligans. Hell yeah! No, I know. I was, I was too, I was too fufu oh, yeah. back then. You know, I was no too way. fancy. I was too. Uh, that place. Is I was too shit. Shit. I never I heard of that place in my life. Wow, that's hoodies, big hoodies, little hoodies. He's ten years younger. They're, bro. they're. It's, it's, it's like an institution, but I never realized how grimy it really was. Which is great. It's great. But my mistake was, number one, it's a 5,000 square foot restaurant that opened for the rest of your life. And then I went and named it the joint. So more like drug implications. Yeah, yeah, of course. So the first like two weeks there was just like nonstop fights. Before even figuring out how to run a restaurant, it was oh taking people to Addy and being the shit and like fights with the people selling drugs. So it was a great experience. <laughs> um But that was also Miami 15 years ago. Now like nowadays you can't do stuff Longer like than that. that shit. But, but that's how it started. Um, so the first story that the first location you opened was called the Joint Bar and Grill. The Joint Bar and Grill, the which was the greatest. Bar. It was the greatest 
disaster in the history of restaurants in Miami because people loved it. We how did a great job. So it lasted two years. Um, and how you going into it? The beginning, I'm sure you're you know excited. Mm -hmm. Going into it, how, how long did it take for you to say like, all right, maybe this wasn't the best decision? Yeah, never, um, never. I was party drunk too much to realize. Yeah, I was drinking a lot. Product of your own. So yeah, you got high. I've never. Yeah, lucky I've never been. A, I'm, I'm not big on. I don't have many vices in life. Um, so lucky I never got into drugs, any kind of drug at all. Drinking was probably my my only kind of vice, but like nothing. Like that's about it. And it was also just number one, depression, stress, drinking, having a good time. Yeah, um, probably gave away way too much alcohol to make it a good business decision. But it was a great learning experience. It was like going to college. I didn't start cooking there probably until like six months in. And I'd cook on Mondays. I'd go get drunk, invite some friends over. And like, hey, I'm going to cook for you in the kitchen. But little by little, I got better at it. And then every Sunday, um, I had this family come into the restaurant to watch the Dolphins game. And they'd be like, go cook me whatever you want and sit down, eat and drink with us. No idea who these guys are. After a few months, a guy pulls me aside. He's like, listen, I know you're struggling here, but I think you're better than this. Like, what do you need to get out of here and open up a real restaurant? And I'm like, oh, shut the fuck up, bro. Who are you? Hey, uh, yeah. hey, these white guys, guys coming good. in here. God's like in sending you a helping tank hand. Tops, like jean shorts. I'm like, get out of here. What are you going to do for me? He keeps hiring me down. I'm like, listen, I'm not joking. What do you need? And I'll take care of you. So I'm like, but maybe this guy's fucking serious. Let me look him up. Um, he he really, him and his family really are like, they're responsible for saving my life and my family's life. He did have money. He gave me a couple hundred thousand. He goes, you don't owe me anything except for pay me back when you can and make sure I have a table. So they're the underfors, Adam Underfor. They own federal medals over here on 27th and... So that's how I got my money up in my first restaurant. And wow. luckily, Barty, my first real restaurant. And luckily, Barty, and I'll never forget, the week before we opened Barty, was like when, right when LeBron James, like his second season with the Heat. Yeah. And we did like a friends and family during the Heat games. And it was a fucking nightmare. Couldn't get a table. I couldn't. Three years. Well, not, not that. Like the, the, the restaurant, the whole, like I was like, there's no way this is going to work out. It was out. a triangle, right? It was the a triangle. You know, I mean, besides just running the kitchen, I couldn't figure it out. And I told my, the day before we opened, I told my dad, I'm like, yo, listen, let's not fucking open this place. Let's just fucking put it for sale and get this guy's money back because we're fucked. And my dad's like, nah, fuck you. We're in here. We're doing it. And I remember I spent the whole night. And for whatever reason, between that night and the day we opened up, like the next 24 hours, something just clicked. And it went perfect. And from day one, we had a two-hour wait. Um, made all the money back within, like, it was it was crazy. It was amazing. Um, what was that place called? Barty and Swan. Barty and Swan. Gastro Pub, yeah. The original. And then from then on, just natural growth and issues with building. When that building got condemned, even though it was a brand new building, we moved across the street. And like, like I said, but luckily that one family would come in every Sunday and like had faith in me and had the generosity in their heart and was like, here's your, here's your chance. Here's your opportunity. So one of the first restaurants besides maybe Michi's and another one where like Miami food was really like doing something and making some noise with it came to ingredients and not just like out back and uh, she's like, damn it. Yeah. I feel your restaurant was one of the ones that kind of started the whole boom of like, let's take a little bit more care about what we're eating and stuff. Yeah. I mean, it probably wasn't as good as we remembered it. Um, you know, <laughs> I think it was pretty fun. I don't, good. I don't know. I don't know yeah. if it was that good, but it was definitely different. The vibe was definitely different. Um, it the was still there, I believe. Right? Yeah. I we still, still do the same it, kind of yeah. old school hip hop vibes kind yeah. of family. But yeah, that's where that's where it all started. A new project now. So uh, let's get people going. What's what's new? What's coming up for you now? So we, we took. Tell we, me about Somi. We took the old Taco Craft location um, in South Miami, right across from Boogie's. I mean, South Miami is one of my. Wait, you just took that over right now? Yeah. yeah. Oh wow. Breaking so news. we've been there for what two weeks now doing construction. Build has been like two weeks, right? Yeah. But that Taco Craft, I thought it was doing good. It's all like the UM students there, but I think the prices were too cheap. Yeah, I mean, I think we're going to get into that as far as pricing. Historically, I always said like, I always want to open up a Mexican restaurant because I've never seen a Mexican restaurant go out of business, true. you know? That's fine. Um, That's true. But yeah, they, don't. <laughs> they, don't. they don't. But it's starting to happen because the price points are just hard, yeah. you know? It's hard to do that, that Taco Tuesday for $2 tacos yeah, because... Correct. But you know what? Even then, it's still cheaper than everything else. Even then, so cheap. So, so it's still good. Look, it's like, hard. It's hard. It's hard. So it's people I don't think realize the profit margins restaurants really leave. 
You know, like the greatest of restaurants are going to give you like 15% profits. So I go always tell people like Kiko, and it's like, yo, where's my discount? I'm like, yo. Shut up. I don't say that shit. <laughs> Never once. I'm like, if I give you 30% You're discount, liar, I'm paying 15% for you to come I don't eat pay my food. This I, don't like, I don't like him that much. I I'm just like, don't pay. Stay away. I don't even pay this. I don't pay. Don't let him, don't let him lie. I ain't gonna lie. I don't pay. I'm like, Kiko, I don't want to pay 15% to see your face. So go home. I ain't paying. Come in. Come see me. Yeah. 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 He's my boy. I ain't paying. I'm gonna fuck. <laughs> but, but yeah, so I mean, when, when, you, when you take into everything, like, into account everything that's happening now, not just inflation, food costs, labor yeah, costs. Yeah, that's one of the points I want to talk about. How insurance, you like the craziest increase we have is insurance. I'm paying for commercial guess, insurance. Yeah. My liability insurance at the rooftop, it's in like 37000 this year. Wow. I was talking to Eaton House because we have the same landlords. I'm like, yo, I'm like, I think they were like at 44000 So just your insurance now. Yeah, you got to pass that cost on to somebody. Bro. It's 40000 a year for insurance. Yeah. You know, that's not the cost of stake. That's not saying like we're and 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 hopefully I don't sound like it's just a business thing. Like, but you have people who are not deservingly making twelve dollars an hour. Nobody should be making that money. But like, we have dishwashers not coming to interview that like, for twenty four dollars an hour. And I'm like, well, I would love to pay you fifty dollars an hour because I know it's hard work. But where do we get that money from? And it's that situation in all aspects of the of the business. Mm. The Just trickle, the, trickle but that, that see it goes back to your earlier point of the real true stresses yeah. of running a company. It goes down to that. All the little variables that get sure. involved yeah. between pricing with clientele. Well, a good example. Menus. Yeah, look, a good example was last summer at the rooftop. So I, I try to make it a point to be because we all know rooftops are like ridiculously expensive. So I always try to make a point that I'm at or below the neighborhood average. Even in Core Gables and rooftops. So I'm always buying what's Ian has charging, what's Luca charging, what these guys charging. I try to stay like a dollar below it. And last summer we saw we saw people struggling a little bit. So we lowered our prices 15, 20%. But right. everything else, so like, struggling even more now. Yeah. I went to the fair the other day; it was empty. Yeah, was it? So like at the end of the day, you, if you're dropping your price by twenty percent, you know you're only making fifteen percent. Now you're like, there's there's a chance where you you slip up a little bit, and then now you're in trouble. Yeah, um, and it's like that in every restaurant. So like, imagine doing a taco restaurant, doing people. Oh, it's a four dollar taco. You're crazy. I'm like, you're crazy. Like, you know what the pork cost, you know what the taco yeah, cost, you know what the dishwasher cost, there. you know what the whole thing cost. <laughs> when Taco Craft closed, I was surprised too. And I yeah, saw America's I saw Marcus some comments friend. on people who put like people like Kiko put like a little about well, they close, you know. And people like, oh, I pay so super expensive. I'm like, yo, on Tuesday they tacos for like a dollar fifty. But no, no. uh, you know what I think? I think there's something wrong in that area, Lee. Because I you So know, here's here's what I say. We know like we're going said we're it. going in there with eyes wide open. Okay? But it's not the area; it's the building. I think it's, it's not the building. Because no, Sunset, yeah, it's a, it's a tombstone, Sunset Place. But that little South Miami block after that, it's always been buzzing, bro. When Taco was open, it was nice. It was always buzzing. Look, I think yeah, it's, but it'll give me one. There's only really a handful of places that are successful. There's, in that area. there's very little. There's, there's Sports Grill. There's the other one. Uh, there's Fiola. Fiola, but uh, that's another. They're, they're, they just got another clientele. Yeah, it's different monster. Yeah. You know, even nobody, my main and these guys closed down, and they're not that far from there. So look, nobody. Well, my main and and and, and even that it was a it was a hotel hotel management hotel kind of deal. But they were doing a good job of bringing like the locals, which is usually. I not think the they case. were. And I think the hotel might be. They might have made a mistake by getting yeah. rid of Nevin. I don't. I mean, I don't see much buzz about that hotel at all anymore. Um, look, it's not slower. Than what downtown Dayton was when we went in there, it's not much slower than what Coral Gables was three years ago. Um, it just needs an injection of new it's life. Like, new I think energy. it's you sustaining. Well, I have, I have sustaining my friend it. runs Ceviche Lovers, and I know him very well. You've worked, you've you've brought yes. him to events and stuff too, and um, you know it's, that place is not you know it's not where it's supposed to be either. You know, yeah, they had raw sushi. I remember when they had raw sushi in that area, raw sushi on the on the corner. Um, and I think we learned a lot today, right? Bro, this was amazing. Uh, one of the things that I was done asking is, what is the stupidest thing that somebody orders as a request or an order that you get that just drives you bananas and it's like the craziest, dumbest thing? You know what? I think we're lucky. Special order. We don't really get much. I think maybe my staff is 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 but good enough like, to prove like a common one. I, we, I don't. I can't tell you. No. I think back in the days, the thing used to annoy the fuck out of me was I cut my burger in four. Oh. <laughs> um, I'm like, when you just fucking cut your burger yourself, bro. Like, yeah, and yeah, I would always yeah, be yeah. like, so I, I, there's a, there's a good, 
Now you cut it like, in four? Now you no, no. It. So like, nah, here's... Right, no, now they they, no, 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 they I, circumvent I, I, me with just a smart thing. Like, I tell them, like, <laughs> by nature, maybe I'm a piece of shit. I don't know. I'm a good people in general. I never hurt anybody. But I'm quick with the go fuck yourselves. A little bit quicker and than I should be. If you order your burger and you ask it to be cut... In four or half comment but below. But it's such a childish upset for know. me. It's it's me being a fucking two year old. It's not yeah. them. So like my staff has learned to just. I'm like, don't ask me. If yeah. there's something you like, it might be the dumbest thing that whatever. I'm stressed out. I'm like, oh fuck this, kick him out. There. Like, so just don't ask me. And yeah. just because I know the appropriate answer is like, yeah, of course we'll put your burger in four. I, I, I got a good so question. So go ask somebody I, I gotta, else. I got a go good ahead. question for yeah. you, okay? And this is for the people out there. And actually, I'm interested in myself. You being in the industry, mm -hmm. you know, I call you a chef, mm -hmm. you know, although you don't like it. What would you say, I don't want to say top, uh, but what would you say are three chefs in the industry right now that you look up to and you Ooh, think that they're doing question. a good job and that you've maybe learned from at one point? So I'm going to say my favorite chef and operator and somebody who if I was more disciplined and hard, harder working and just better at life in general is Ford Fry. He's based mostly out of Atlanta. He's in Dallas. He's in Nashville. He's in Charleston. That guy, like, I'll go to, I'll go out of town just to go to his restaurants. Oh, wow. That's um, awesome. Like, like, legit, like, I'll plan a vacation, like, where we're going. We're going to go to Atlanta. Yeah, I do that, we're going to yeah. go. Just because, and he, had, he always has, like, four or five different concepts in each city. I've never had a bad meal, bad so That guy hits on every point. So he's, like, my, my number one. Number two. How about local? The person who I have. Emulated and looked up to more than anybody in Miami, um, and I know, I know he's not a fan of mine right now. <laughs> it's Jose Mendin, Mendin. Um, what Mendin? I know that bastard. Yeah, yeah, um, he's a great chef. He's he's probably the number one in Miami for me. Wow. Jose Even though I know he's taking a step back, but Pub Buddy. Oh, hey, hey, babe, put that in the post. Um, you heard what he's saying. Pub Buddy is was yeah, uh, another local restaurant. chef, another up and coming one chef more, right now that right right you see more. that I'm you're, like, tell you're impressed you my with. My favorite restaurant that for whatever reason doesn't get as much like a claim. Your or favorite maybe restaurant? Yeah. Okay. Beaker and Gray. Oh, like I've been there before. Wow. It's good. I think Beaker and Gray has a small place. I think they're all like plated beautiful. The cocktails are great. It's very cozy. It's very hey. homey. Hey. Um, Who's the chef there? I forgot his name. I am. No, yeah, you, 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 that's a good one. Yeah, it's a really good one. I like, it. and it's not hey, it's, it's, it's not super expensive. No, it's I've very approachable. They're, yeah. they're meant to be a neighborhood place. Yeah, they, they, the food looks beautiful. The food's Winwood, amazing. No? Yeah, it's in Winwood. And for what, like, they're always busy, so they have their. Yeah. But they should yeah. be up there with, to me, with the cues, the arietes, the olives. They should be up there, and for whatever reason, people just overlook them. All right, so now Ryan, one more, one, whole, one more. That's us. You you have your restaurant in Coral Gables. You got Sabala Rooftop here on Geralda Ave, which I'm a big fan of. And there's so many open, bro. I want to know. That's what wait, you want no, to know. no. What is your favorite local restaurant in Coral Gables? This guy, I'm gonna ask him questions. My favorite local. If there's one restaurant I go to consistently in Coral Gables. And even though he always throws a little like jab at me saying that what I do is easier because I'm not fine dining and he Ooh. is. Um, so fuck you, Ernie, is uh, Café Violetto. Okay. We go, to, we go to Café Violetto. My parents, I don't go out much, especially with the kids. But we're probably like some sort of my family is there with Ernie wow. at least once a month, I'd say. Wow, that's good. Wow. And it's and look, I haven't been there yet. Going so back to that, oh, I haven't one been there the, years, but it's very One of the things I learned most also... And I, I, like we try to implement it at advice because Sabala is just way too hard. Is I remember when I was young going to Cafe Violetto and Ernie being at the front door, and when you're waiting, hey, here's a glass of wine, here's a glass of thing. Yeah. So just the like the Service. way Ernie makes you feel when you walk into that restaurant, um, to me makes it one of the best yeah. restaurants in Coral Gables. So my question, Somi, when does it open? When does Somi open? So Somi, so we still don't know what the concept's going to be. Um, because you know how I am. I changed my mind. Today is Wednesday. Who knows what I'm going to do? Ballpark figure. It's definitely not going to open up before September. Um, the way we restructure our leases, we have six months of free rent so for construction. Six. So I'm going to take every second of it. So um, about, about six months then? Yeah, September. All right. So I'll go on vacation hey, with the family. Hang out. for Chef Georgie Ramos? No, we're good to go. I already got people out there texting me saying, let's go. All right. <laughs> right. I'm glad you're having you here. We got to bring right, you back, though, man. Thank you. Got got man. I appreciate you. Yeah, and uh, look out for Cebada and Somi. Most likely. And everything uh, that he does, guys. Thank Later, you guys. so much. Take care. Bye-bye.